As a landscape and architectural photographer, I am always aware of the significance of what I am taking, which could be echoing part of my history as well as that of the nation. Having a Scandinavian surname, I often wonder when my ancestors arrived and where they settled. We have two major organisations protecting our historic buildings and landscapes, the National Trust and English Heritage. Much of the Trust's properties are stately homes, whereas English Heritage looks after castles and abbeys, many abandoned and in ruins, having suffered neglect, but now rescued for the nation. Stepping back with English heritage can take you a long way, sometimes 4,000 years, and this program explores a personal selection of their properties from prehistory to the 20th century. Castlerick Stone Circle, outside Keswick in the Lake District, must be one of the most dramatically situated monuments. It is intriguing to imagine how life would have looked around 3000 BC. The mountains would look much the same, but not perhaps the hinterland. I have visited this absorbing place many times, photographing it in all weathers. Maiden Castle in Dorset could even be older. Several years ago I paid a visit from Surrey to coincide with the late afternoon sun. Timing? That was perfect, the low light now emphasising the contours of its multi-layered ramparts that enclose an area equivalent to 50 football pitches. It is believed that Richborough on the Kent coast is where the Romans first stepped onto British soil in AD 43. Geographically, it would make sense because of its closeness to Europe. The sea since has receded. Today, it is hard to imagine that Richborough was once a port and that a sea channel, the Wonsum Channel, which has since silted over to become the River Stour, extended to Reculver on the North Kent coast, making Thanet an island, which now only exists in name. As if to announce their arrival, the Romans constructed a colossal triumphal arch as a ceremonial gateway into Britain. Sadly, it has not survived, and there is very little evidence of it today. The abandoned Roman fort at Reculver became an Anglo-Saxon monastery. By 1807, the church had become deserted and was unsafe. Eventually, it was demolished with the aid of gunpowder, leaving only the twin towers, but without their spires. A glimpse of Roman high life is seen at Lullingstone in the peaceful Darrant Valley, about 70 miles up Watling Street, today's A2 Highway. The earliest house was built around AD 100. By 360, a new dining room was added with remarkable mosaics, which today are preserved under cover. Now, this mosaic shows the abduction of the Princess Europa by Jupiter, disguised as a bull.
William made his entrance at Pevensey Bay in 1066, and a famous battle quickly ensued, a date engraved on our minds. Following Harold's defeat, William the Conqueror founded the Abbey to celebrate his victory, positioning the high altar on the spot where King Harold fell. After the dissolution and many years of neglect, demolition and a fire, the Abbey ruins are now managed by English heritage. The novice's chamber presents a challenge for the photographer. This shot is handheld at a thirteenth of a second and it was taken several years ago with the E3 and 12 to 60 lens, a pre-micro four-thirds camera. The great gatehouse also commands our attention. William was crowned King of England on Christmas Day 1066 at Westminster Abbey. Soon there followed a massive building program of castles and churches in a style of architecture known as Norman and much in evidence today. At York, previously inhabited by the Romans and Vikings, construction of its Norman castle commenced in 1068, the cathedral in 1080. Of the castle, only Clifford's Tower, a keep, stands, which came later, built in the 1250s during the reign of Henry III. Although only a shell, many steps have to be negotiated before the tower is reached. After more steps, its ramparts can be walked with wonderful views over the city, including the Minster. Much of Dover Castle was built in the 1180s, during the reign of Henry II, continuing into the 13th century under King John and Henry III. However, the site's history, which guards the Straits of Dover, goes back much further. Not much remains of an Iron Age hillfort, but we can still marvel at two earlier buildings, a Roman lighthouse dating from the first half of the second century, and an Anglo-Saxon church from around AD 1000, but heavily restored in the 19th century. In the Great Tower, English heritage have reconstructed how it might have looked when Henry and his court were in residence, an imaginary recreation of a 12th century royal palace. From a castle for defending the nation to one in name only, Stokesy Castle in Shropshire, which is a residence. Built by a wealthy wool merchant in the 1280s and 90s, it looks more romantic than a threat to possible invaders. It has a moat, but its military appearance would not repel much. Eye-catching is the showy gatehouse, which came later, but inside the hall it has a roof supported by three wooden arches, a rare example of this period. Following the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII in 1538, Rivo did not suffer from plundering due to its remoteness. Much of the remaining structure is still at original height, but it assumed a new role 200 years later when Thomas Duncombe created a terrace overlooking the valley with dramatic views of the ruins between trees now admired for its pictorial qualities. 
The abbey was one of a group of Cistercian monasteries located in remote Yorkshire valleys during the early 12th century, and at its height supported 650 men, starting from just 12 monks when it was founded in 1132. Warwickshire's Kenilworth Castle was a royal palace and home for a number of illustrious figures, and they included King John, Simon de Montfort and John of Gaunt. Elizabeth I stayed four times. After the Civil War of 1642, Parliament toughened its attitude, demolishing royalist strongholds, but the gatehouse became a residence. By the 18th century, the ruins began to interest tourists, helped by the publication of Sir Walter Scott's novel Kenilworth in 1821. The Elizabethan garden is a vanishing feature elsewhere, but here restored by English heritage. On a trip to Coventry Cathedral, I planned an extension to Kenilworth Castle, which by a stroke of good fortune was not too busy. Deal Castle in Kent is an architectural godsend for photographers. Built to the orders of Henry VIII, its overall shape resembles the Tudor Rose, but its structure has more to do with defences than some romantic notion. Its unique multi-lobed design provided firing power for 140 guns ranged in five tiers. Photographers no doubt will make good compositional use of a replica gun aimed at the beach. At the Stuart period, we meet the stately home, where people of wealth moved from town to country to create their own Garden of Eden, with a house to impress by employing the talents of Robert Adam and Lancelot Capability Brown. What we see at Orderly End in Essex, not far from Saffron Walden, isn't the complete building. King Charles II purchased the house in 1666 as a ready-made palace because it was close to the races at Newmarket. He relinquished the house, regarding it as old-fashioned, and later it was reduced in size. Robert Adam was commissioned to create reception rooms and Capability Brown swept away the formal landscape. Place Pond, a fish pond, dates back to the time when the house was Walden Abbey and therefore kept. Capability Brown's influence can be felt at Rest Park, south of Bedford, but only around the periphery. Since 1900, Rest Park has had a chequered history, and it is only in recent years that the entire estate has been acquired by English Heritage, who are active in its restoration. The main focus is the Long Water, created in the 17th century. It leads the eye towards the pavilion, which, since my visit, has now been restored. Some of the rooms inside the house can also be visited. Robert Adam's work can be seen at Kenwood, especially the library, regarded as one of his finest interiors. Kenwood is situated on the edge of Hampstead Heath and entrance is free. On my visit, photography was permitted and achieving shots without people required a large measure of patience. Kenwood has an internationally famous art collection, the Ivor Bequest, featuring paintings by Turner, Constable and Rembrandt. Downhouse had a famous occupant, Charles Darwin, but it is no architectural wonder. Visitors can follow the Sandwalk, a woodland circuit used by Darwin when thinking about his researches. The house was purchased by English Heritage in 1996, when its condition had deteriorated. 
Since then, much work has been carried out, including recreating some of the rooms as they would have looked in Darwin's time. We can only imagine what Whitley Court looked like in its heyday because it suffered a disastrous fire in 1937, and only the shell remains. After many years of uncertainty when it narrowly survived demolition, English Heritage took it over in 1984 and have restored the garden. One of its centerpieces is the Perseus and Andromeda Fountain, one of the grandest in Europe, located on the South Patia. Between 11 a.m. and an hour before closing, it fires on the hour. The trick to witness it on your own is to stay for the last performance, which on my visit was at 5 p.m. The parish church was not affected by the fire, and although not managed by English heritage, it must be visited for its very fine Baroque interior. Some of the fittings are imported from the demolished chapel at Cannons Edgware in Middlesex, the Duke of Chandos's mansion. Eltham was originally a 13th century moated manor house, enlarged by successive monarchs to become a medieval royal palace. Eventually it fell into decline, eclipsed by nearby Greenwich and Hampton Court. In 1933 it was purchased by Stephen Courtauld, who restored the Great Hall, adding a modern house in the Art Deco style and a new garden. Eltham Hall spans the decades from late 13th century until the 1930s, bringing together an architectural blend that also embraces the properties from many periods in between that are managed and protected for us today by English heritage. <laughs>